And good morning for all of you who are watching us by way of live stream or perhaps, or perhaps experience first. We are glad that you're a part of our worship service this morning on this Memorial Day Sunday. And we're going to be looking at the subject, good soldiers, good soldiers. The Christian life includes a life that is filled with struggle and warfare. Now, that's not a very popular message. We don't hear a lot about that these days on Christian television and all other kind of media outlets. But the truth is, when we are saved, then we are saved in the midst of a struggle, and we are saved to struggle as good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be unpacking that and looking at what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. In fact, will you go ahead and take your copy of God's Word and turn with me, please? 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, notice what the Bible says. Paul is writing to Timothy. He's talking about being a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And he says, share in sufferings as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. A little over a month ago, Mary and I spent most of a day at the uh, National D-Day Memorial, which, as you know, honors those who died in one of the most pivotal battles of World War II. As we walked around the memorial that day, it was almost a solemn journey as we read the names and thought about the struggles and the sufferings and the sacrifices that were made by those soldiers on that cold, gray, stormy morning there on June 6, 1944, along the Normandy beaches in France. Now, as you probably know, this special memorial has a very specific reason why it is located in Bedford, Virginia, because 30 soldiers... 30 of them, which helped to make up for Company A of the 116th Infantry, 29th Division, were from Bedford. And at the end of D-Day, only 18 soldiers from the entire 230 company had survived. And of, and of those killed, 19 of those soldiers were from Bedford, Virginia. Uh, they were dead. Almost all of them died within the first 15 minutes of the Battle of Omaha Beach. Four more soldiers would die in the Battle of Normandy during that campaign. Now, with the population of Bedford being 3,200 citizens, no other American community suffered any greater proportional casualties and losses of its citizens than did Bedford on D-Day. Now, as we already have been reminded, this day is our Memorial Day weekend, and I want us to look at what Paul said. We read just a moment ago the responsibilities we have to be good soldiers for the sake of Jesus Christ. Paul is talking about this very thing, and he uses the example, the picture, the illustration of a soldier to remind Christians of who they are, of what they're supposed to be and what they have been called to be about in their kingdom assignment from heaven as given to them by God for their spiritual military post for whatever duration or length of season their deployment might last on this side of eternity's doorstep. Now, God saves us to shape us. He shapes us to use us, and He wants to use us by sending us to change the world by sharing the gospel to people who have yet to hear or believe. The Christian life, again, is a life of struggle. It's not a life of ease. It's not a life of, of simply enjoying the good things in this life in anticipation of enjoying even the better things of the life that is to come in heaven. It's a struggle. It's a warfare. Paul reminds us in Ephesians that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities, with powers, with rulers of darkness in high places. We are at war. It is a spiritual warfare. Now, this morning, let's see what Paul meant and what God wants us to know when it comes to Christians. And hopefully all of us are. If not, all of us can be before we leave when it comes to Christians serving as good soldiers under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, notice the very first thing. Number one, good soldiers will suffer willingly. Good soldiers 
will suffer willingly. Notice what Paul said uh, there in verse 3. Paul talks about in verse 3 saying, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ. In verse 3, he says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Now, this is very different from the idea uh, of the Christian life being nothing but fun in the sun happiness and blessings of health and wealth and worldly success. Remember who's writing this to Timothy, it's Paul. And man, was he ever qualified to talk about and teach on suffering? He had a PhD in it, didn't he? I mean, he had been shipwrecked, he had been beaten, he had been scourged, he had been stoned, he had been starved, he had been imprisoned, and he would ultimately be executed Church history tradition says by being beheaded there under the orders of the Roman emperor Nero. And so he's talking about suffering going hand in hand with being saved. Now, the prosperity gospel of today, which is so attractive to people world, world, world round, and why wouldn't it be? Uh, it, it is known as the health and wealth gospel or its most popular brand today is the Word of Faith movement. It is actually a perversion of the gospel of Christ because it claims that God rewards increases in faith with increases in health and wealth. How many of you know someone who's really sick and really faithful? I do. How many of you have known someone that is, has battled or is battling cancer or some other chronic illness, and yet they have a strong faith, maybe a stronger faith in Jesus than you have? How many of you know someone who doesn't have a lot of this world's goods, but they have the joy of Jesus in their life and in their heart, and they have a very strong faith that is an encouragement to you, and you admire that? Have you ever seen how soldiers live in the field when they're under deployment? It's not easy. It's difficult. It's uncomfortable. It's hard. It's, uh, it's inconvenient. It's dangerous. If, if you're a sailor in the United States Navy, when you go on board your assigned ship, you know you're not uh, walking on the on-ramp of Carnival Cruise Lines. Amen for all of you guys who served in the Navy. If you're a soldier in the field of battle, you're not expecting at the end of a long march to check into the Holiday Inn Express for a good night's sleep. Here's what we need to remember. Paul is telling Timothy that he needed to suffer as a good soldier of Christ. Uh, the reason why was because a soldier's sufferings have, has a purpose. All of our sufferings as saints, they have a purpose toward the achieving of the greater mission that we are all a part of. Now, do you remember what the Bible says in Romans 8, 28? Sure you do. Uh, the Bible says, for we know that all things, all things, hard things, sad things, sorrowful things, suffering things, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are the called according to His own purpose. In the novel entitled, entitled Awe, But Your Land is Beautiful, uh, the writer Alan Payton tells the story of a fellow by the name of Robert Mansfield. Uh, he was the headmaster of a school. Uh, and it was a school during a time of intense racial segregation in the society and culture. His school was barred from competing uh, against a black school. And in protest, he decided to resign his post when he could not get the school board to change its mind on the matter. Now, when he resigned, his friend said to him, you know you will be wounded, don't you? They're not going to let this go easily in the decision that you have made. And this is what Mansfield said. When I go up there and I stand before the judge, what if he were to ask me, where are your wounds? And if I say I haven't any, then he may say, was there nothing to fight for? I don't want to have to face that question. Dear friend, when we know that people's eternal souls are at stake, when we know that Jesus Christ has paid the ultimate price and laid down his life and shed his blood for us on the cross, we know that there is something worth fighting for. Now, look at the screen, James chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. Notice what the Bible says, For we know that all things work together for good 
to those who love the Lord and are the called according to his, well, that's Romans 8. I mean, James chapter 1. Skip on over to the next one. Um, well, uh, let me just go ahead and share it with you. James chapter 1 uh, says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, the Bible says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10? He said, Blessed are those who suffer for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A Christian, in a very true sense, is called to be and saved to be a spiritual soldier in the Lord's army. Therefore, we should not think that our experience is going to be without difficulty, hardship, or sacrifice. We should not be surprised by suffering. We should be surprised that we do not suffer more than we do. Here's the point. When you suffer, then God is either allowing it or He's causing it because your suffering our suffering fits together for his plan for our lives in the way that he has determined is best in accomplishing his redemptive plan for the world and all those who will be saved. Uh, preacher Alistair Begg said, the same grace that reconciles me to God also antagonizes me to the devil. The same grace that, recon that reconciles you to God is the same grace that antagonizes you to the devil. When Jesus taught us to pray, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, then that means God's mission always comes first. His way, his work, and his will. You know, one of the things that we can say about suffering is it can be uh, sometimes excruciatingly hard and difficult when it is more than a moment, but seems to be an ongoing, never-ending experience. Suffering, get this, suffering is hardest when it is more of a season than simply a short-term event. Suffering is hardest when it is more of a season than simply a short-term event. Some of you are still suffering because of what you've lost years ago. It might be your health. It might be your job and financial security. It might be a friendship. It might be your spouse. It might be your child. And the suffering for you has not stopped. And in many ways, it will not stop, even though you grieve in the hope that is ours in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, until you are with Christ in the heavenlies, in the place that he's prepared for you. And you are there with God's forever family of faith. But what we need to remember in the meantime is as the suffering continues, it does not happen without purpose, without the resources necessary that we need to outlast it, to make it through it, to perhaps overcome it. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, 19, but my God shall supply all of your needs according to the riches of glory, Christ Jesus our Lord. Sergeant First Class Paul Ray Smith, Paul Ray Smith, he could have retreated, but doing so would have allowed the Iraqi troops to overrun an American station during a hotly contested firefight in the battle for Baghdad there at the International Airport. Instead of retreating against overwhelming odds, he grabbed his rifle and an anti-tank weapon, and he began firing and holding off about 100 enemy soldiers. When a fellow sh soldier shouted to Smith, saying, fall back and take cover, he refused. His friend said, I could tell he was not going to leave. In that firefight, fighting by himself, as his comrades pulled back, he received a head wound, and he died at his post. Yet his efforts stopped that Iraqi enemy attack on April 4, 2003. 
Now, two years later, President Bush presented the Medal of Honor, there you see the picture, to Smith's 11-year-old son, David. And drawing from his soldier's example, the United States Army, after Smith received this, uh, the nation's highest honor and medal, they drew up a new creed in their training procedures, which included these words, I will always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never leave a fallen comrade. And Smith's widow made this comment. Paul is showing the soldiers what it means to be a soldier. He's showing soldiers what it means to be a soldier. You know, we're supposed to do the same thing as Christian soldiers. Listen, listen to what the Bible says in James chapter 5, verse 10. As an example of suffering and patience, we live our lives as an example of how to endure suffering and how to live out with patience. Friend, are you living in a way that is an example for others to follow? Are you living in a particular way that is showing others what it means to be a good soldier for Jesus Christ? Are you being a good example to your loved ones, to your friends, to your family members, to your church family members, to those you go to school with, to those you work with? What kind of an example are you giving others? And if not, then why not start being a good example today? Today. Good soldiers will suffer willingly, but good soldiers also will defend carefully. Going back to our text, defend carefully. The Bible says, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. The word entangled is the Greek word impleco, which means to weave into something. It's like taking different strands of a cord and weaving it together, weaving them together to form a rope. Uh, what are you doing? What are you doing to avoid getting entangled, caught up, distracted from the way God wants you to live, from the way God wants you to follow Him, from the way God wants you to serve Him, from the way that God wants you to love Him? When the Bible talks about being sober-minded, it's not talking about simply not being drunk. It's talking about being alert, being aware being on guard. We are to guard against, be alert to the temptations of complacency, compromise, laziness, are becoming enamored with those things that are distracting and will diminish the power of our faith in Christ and our focus upon Him. The things that would call, cause us to be double-minded. Remember, the Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And we don't want to be that kind of a soldier, divided in mind and heart, distracted by what is taking place, enamored with things that are opposed to the will and the way and the work of a righteous God. Now, can you imagine a soldier in the middle of a hotly contested firefight? There he is. It, it, it's a dangerous situation. He's fighting shoulder to shoulder, side by side with his comrades, and suddenly he gets the idea in his head, I think I'd like to go roast marshmallows. And he thinks about that as he's fighting, and pretty soon he begins to lose focus. And then he decides, I think that's a good thing. I'll do it right now. And he slides back, crawls back to the rear of the fight, starts a little fire, and breaks out a pack of marshmallows and begins to roast them by the fire. You say, well, that's ridiculous. A soldier would never do that. How many times have you and I as Christian soldiers, withdrawn from the fight because some little thought got stuck in our mind and we lost focus. Instead of concentrating on the one whom we were supposed to be following and serving, we began concentrating on ourselves in doing what we thought sounded fun. Do you know one of the greatest struggles that Christians have today when it comes to distractions? Here it is, smartphone. That's it. Yours and mine. The Wall Street Journal reports that in this article, Adrian Ward, who's a cognitive psychologist and marketing professor at the University of Texas at Austin, 
He had been studying the way smartphones and the internet affect our thoughts and judge, judgments for a decade. In his own work, as well as that of others, he has seen mounting evidence that using a smartphone or even hearing one ring or vibrate produces a wealth of distractions that makes it harder to concentrate on a difficult problem or job. The division of attention, he writes, impedes reasoning and performance. Going back to 2015, uh, a study involving 166 subjects found that when people's phones buzz or beep while they're in the middle of a challenging task, immediately their focus begins to waver, their attention begins to drift, their work becomes sloppier, whether they check their phone or not. In another study that same year showed that when people hear their phone ring but are unable to answer it, their blood pressure spikes, their pulse quickens, their problem-solving skills decline. Their attention span has been hijacked by something else. You know, a lot of Christians are really in that same position, aren't they? Aren't some of us in that same position today? Uh, we, we're distracted from knowing, from hearing, from seeing God's will for our life and the opportunities of serving Him that He places before us, whereby we can point someone else to faith in Christ. We've allowed other things that we've become enamored with to hijack our minds and really hijack our hearts. So we're no longer focused on the job at hand. We need a soldier's mindset. We, we need that, that attitude, that commitment where we're not going to waste our lives. We're not going to waste this moment that God has given to us. And the opportunity to experience the victory for a war already won, that is an opportunity we do not want to miss. Great illustration of this point. Uh, when Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD, uh, as you know, it actually covered the entire city of Pompeii, the ancient Roman city. Uh, and it covered it in ash and lava. And wherever people went, that's where they died. If they hid out in a basement, that became their tomb. If they hid up uh, on the roof uh, or upper room, that's where they died as well. Uh, as you know, if you've seen any of the pictures or specials of a fascinating excavation as we're seeing what Roman life was like, how decadent it was, decadent, how decorated, how beautiful it was aesthetically, how advanced it was, um, we're finding out things we never knew before. One of the interesting discoveries is they continue to unearth people who died right where they fell. At the city gate, they've unearthed a Roman sentinel, a guard, and he was stationed there at the city gate. And when they began to find his body, his hands were still clasping his weapon, his spear. He was still at his post where his commander had told him to be. No matter that the earth shook beneath him, no matter that the sky fell with fire above him, he stayed by the post and he stood firm. Now, that should be a picture and encouragement to all of us because listen to what the Bible says. Look carefully then at how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Finally, this is all in Ephesians, as Paul is writing, chapter 5. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, look at the verses 13 and 14. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand firm. Having done all. Be sure you stand firm. Good soldiers will suffer willingly. Good soldiers will defend carefully. And we close with this, good soldiers will aim purposefully. What is the aim of a good soldier? It is to please his commander, his general, his leader, to fulfill to the best of his abilities the assignment, the command, the order that he has received. Now, two things about this. Number one, you can please God. Does that not blow your mind? As, as frail, as finite as our understanding is in this old world, as weak as we are, as how many times we mess up, you can please almighty, perfect, holy God. 
you can please him. Now, the question is not, can we please him? And that, that, that blows my mind every time I think about it, that I can please God, me, Brian Smith? The same thing is true for you. So the question is not, can I please God? Because the Bible tells me that I can. But will I please him? It's not a question of potential or possibility. It's a question of will. It's a question of choice. And because you can please God, then you should please God. We all should. This should be our goal. Martin Niemöller, who suffered under the Nazis in the 30s when Hitler came to power, uh, he said this, the gospel is not defense, but rather attack. And it is up to the world to decide its position. The gospel is glad tidings, and we will not allow the gladness it gives to be taken from us. I like that. Even though he was in a concentration camp, he would not allow the gladness of the gospel and the mission that God had given to him and entrusted to all of us as his church to be taken from him. Isn't it the Lord who said that his church, not even the gates of hell, would prevail against it? That means we are all on offense, not defense. Now, some of us like playing defense because that's what we were good at. But as boys, as kids, as girls, when we were playing a sport, didn't we always like to have the chance to play offense? Sure we did. Well, the Bible says the church is to play offense. One of the greatest Christian leaders uh, during my lifetime, John R. W. Stott. He was the rector of All Souls Langham Place in London. He was a peerless preacher, Bible scholar, and teacher, evangelist, author, global Christian leader, and was a friend to so many in the ministry. Three weeks before he died, he was being visited by a very close, lifelong friend of his, and his friend said, John, how would you like for me to pray for you? And very weakly, barely able to speak, that great saint of God said this, pray that I will be faithful to Jesus until my last breath. Pray that I'll be faithful to Jesus until my last breath. What a radical way to live your life compared to so many in this world who are addicted to mediocrity who are satisfied with just getting by, who thinks, well, it's okay, God will forgive me. No! Yes, He will forgive you, but no, don't have that attitude. Don't spit in the face of grace. Don't diminish the worthiness of the Almighty. Don't forget and lay aside the awesomeness of His holiness. Strive to be what you can, faithful to Him, until your last breath. I believe this was exactly how the Apostle Paul lived his life. Listen to what he said to Timothy. He said, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And the Lord will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the movie Pearl Harbor, which came out uh, longer than I care to confess because it doesn't seem that long, but my, how time flies. You remember in that movie, you have two friends. It's the story, really, of two friends, Rafe, played by Ben Affleck, and Danny, played by the actor Josh Hartnett, who survived the attack on Pearl Harbor and the inner World War II as, as ace fighter pilots. Well, America, if you remember your history, was slow to engage in the war. And so there were American pilots that went over and flew and fought alongside and with the RAF. Well, in the movie, Rafe is one of those pilots. And he's walking past a Spitfire that had just made it back, but the pilot had died, but he landed his plane. And as he's walking past a British officer in the RAF, a messenger comes up and talks about how two more Spitfires had just been shot down. And seeing Rafe walk past the American pilot, the commander turns to him and says, are all Yanks as anxious as you to get themselves killed, pilot officer? And Rafe doesn't hesitate when he says, I'm not anxious to die, sir. I'm anxious to matter. I'm not anxious to die. I'm anxious to matter. What a great line 
for the child of God, anxious to matter by his grace and for his glory. You know, that is how you and I should be looking at our lives in this world, anxious to matter. Good soldiers will suffer willingly. Good soldiers will defend carefully. And good soldiers will aim purposefully to please the one who sent them and saved them. Sergeant Dennis Weichel uh, died in Afghanistan in a very unexpected fashion. He'd only been in country for a couple of weeks, and he was a part of a, a, an American military convoy, and, and they were driving fast, and he was in the lead vehicle out ahead of everyone else, and he noticed, he and his men noticed that there were uh, boys and girls, Afghanistan, Af, Afghan children play, in the road picking up brass cartridge shells, spent shells, which they could sell for a few cents. Well, they stopped their vehicle, got out, and got all the children out of the road before the convoy came blazing by. But a little girl, not really understanding why she had to leave the road, turned around and darted right back out into the road. She wanted a few more spent shells, cartridges. Well, Sergeant Weichel saw this happen, and he turned around and ran as fast as he could to get out of the way of a 16-ton army truck that was barreling down at them at high speed. He succeeded. He got the little girl to safety, but he himself was struck by the vehicle and would die from his injuries. His friend, Sergeant Corbett, said, he would have done that for anybody. That was the way he was. He would give you the shirt off his back if you needed it. He was that type of a soldier, that type of a guy. So what kind of a soldier are you? What type of a soldier are you? Are you the kind that is a good soldier for Christ, that you love him with all of your heart, you seek to serve him as best as you can. When you fail and falter, you ask for his forgiveness, and you move on by trusting him, as I heard someone give a testimony to this morning. Are you the type of good soldier where you are looking forward to seeing him one day, seeking to live your life in the hope that you will hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. What kind of a soldier are you? A good soldier knows what to fight against, the world, the flesh, and the pride of life, our threefold enemy. We know that we are in war against spiritual forces and rulers of darkness in high places. For Satan goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And yet the Bible says if we submit to God and resist the devil, the devil will flee for us. Why? Because we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. We also know what to fight for. Fight for seeing men and women saved. Fight for making more disciples in Jesus' name. Fight for the glory of God, the redemptive plan of the Father and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. What kind of a soldier have you been? Moreover, what kind of a soldier this Memorial Day and afterwards will you be?